All right. Well, you know, we've we've had the draft, we've had the schedule release, and now you get to the down part of the year. But the NFL news keeps on coming with a big splash in the off season, you know, deal making market. Uh, Justin Jefferson becoming the highest paid non quarterback in NFL history, thirty five million dollars a year. The Vikings lock him up to a four year, one hundred forty million dollar deal. <sighs> With a hundred and ten million of it guaranteed, incredible contract, and I I saw you tweeted about it. I did too. That we we both agree this was kind of a no brainer for Minnesota, despite a lot of their struggles across their roster to lock down the what you know many would say is the best receiver in the NFL oh, at yeah. this time, uh, especially to do it before some of these other wide receivers start pushing that market further and further. I thought it was a great move by Minnesota, and now they can focus on the offseason with a young quarterback and not have this stuff in the back of their heads. I mean, I said it last week when the Jalen Waddle deal got done, and I know we have some thoughts on that too, is like there's just more pressure mounting on Cincinnati and and, uh, Minnesota to figure out what they're doing and how they're going to go about this. I think Minnesota's deal signifies to everyone else that if you're the agent of Jamar Chase or you're the agent of CeeDee Lamb right now, you look at and you say, okay, that is now the benchmark. We cannot go above that, and we we probably know we can't argue for more than that. So now we know we're worth more than an A.J. Brown, right, who was the highest-paid wide receiver, but we're not going to be paying paid more than Nick Bosa and, and Justin Jefferson. So where do we fall now fall in that line? It's an interesting line know, I, of demarcation. I feel like CD might have an argument though, because I've seen a lot of comparisons. Like he has more CD touchdowns numbers. in their first, and, and they have a very comparable. They they've both been in yeah. the league the same amount of time. Like they both have a very comparable, um, you know, spreadsheet to compare. And so, well, yeah, I mean, CD could make that argument because someone someone out there would pay him that. I would imagine. Like, well, Dallas. I mean, there he's in the right yeah. spot. He's in the right yeah. spot for the he place is. to be paid. I. It's going to be really interesting to watch now. What happens with Jamar yeah. Chase? What happens with T. Higgins? What happens with CeeDee Lamb? Those are the three now names floating. I love this for Minnesota because this is what you should do and this is what you can do when you have a rookie quarterback. Yeah. When exactly. your team commits to the rookie quarterback, it frees up, pay everyone else and build a and make sure your superstars are happy and build as much of a super team as you can. You don't have to pay. You hope that McCarthy's the right guy. And if he is the right guy, you don't have to pay him for at least three seasons. Like that gives you this, this deal will be done in three seasons, right? Like, and what I love about this deal too, is it's so front loaded. He getting 88 million guaranteed today at signing. That's insane to think about that check hitting your bank account, 88 million at signing. Uh, yeah, he might uh, be able to get himself some things. Uh, you know what I mean? Like he's got a little money, a little, a little cash to burn up in Minnesota. Uh, but it, it is, um, I think it, it makes a lot of sense. And if you're a guy like Waddle, you're still like pumped. You're still a really, you got paid a ton of money. Um, you got paid a lot of guarantee and you're not even the number one guy, right? Like exactly. you get well, that, you get that thing. pressure. Yeah. Waddle, Waddle got a great deal. Like if you're, if you're T Higgins, you look at that and you go crap. Like that's the deal I want. But it's like, well, now my team's got to pay Jamar Chase money to, you know, uh, you know, Justin Jefferson's money to Jamar Chase. To me, I think T. Higgins is probably going to have to find a new place to play football next year, and he'll get a nice deal yeah. next year. The yeah. smartest thing for him to do, in my opinion, is to play on that tag, make make put up giant numbers this year, and then make himself a ton of money next offseason. And, and I think the other smart thing to do is for the Bengals to sign Jamar Chase to a deal that looks similar but a little less than this deal and for the Cowboys to do the same similar, but a little less than this deal. And you move on. Um, I don't, there's no wide receiver right now, in my opinion, that's that should be paid higher than Justin Jefferson. And to me, if you're going to pay a wide receiver higher than Justin Jefferson, let's see how the wide receiver market resets in a couple years. If there's a guy who shows up, you know, what does a Marvin Harrison Jr. look like when he gets to the end of his rookie deal, right? Sure. And how how big is the cap at that point in time? I don't feel like this this number should be surpassed for at least two or three years. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Uh, speaking about Jalen Waddell's deal, it was three years, 84.75 80. million, 76 of that guaranteed, 
So he was making 28.25 per it's year. Crazy. And I agree with that. I think this is also signaling that, uh, you know, maybe I know that Tyreek still has another season after this year on his, you know, uh, contract, but it's, it's much easier to get out of. Like, I'm wondering if yeah. the uh, Dolphins are sensing that maybe he's going to be retiring after the end of this year, or maybe he they're talked about trying it. to get a, a move off of it. Uh, type of situation because that is a lot of money for your number two wide receiver, but they're also seeing the trends where you got to put your money there. Yeah. This also while, signals they can't pay Tua what yeah what he's going to want now because uh, Hill and and Waddle are making so much money. I also think though it makes sense too that that um, if you're going to again go to a rookie quarterback next year, you know what I mean, or you're going to make like yeah, a move right. like that. You can pay it. You haven't paid Tua yet, so you might as well pay your pay your weapons, especially when your quarterback is a Tua who needs really good weapons. And Waddle has shown to me that he can be a number one. Like if he eventually he is yes, the number he's one, got that talent for sure. Like in a year or two, when this contract's still going, and 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 you know, and he'll either retires or they re-sign him or he goes somewhere else. It, like if Jalen Waddle is your number one, it feels like he's he's a one. Like he's a one. Like in the sense of like a DJ Moore is a one. They're not. They're not Jamar Chase. They're not Justin Jefferson. But they are really, really great weapon. That if you if that's your number one weapon, you have a really solid offense. Yeah, no question. Uh, if you missed our episode last week, go check it out. It was a quarterback tiers by division, uh, breaking down uh, how we would rank the quarterbacks uh, based on their division in the yeah. AFC and the NFC. Uh, now we're going to do the same, only with head coaches, and this one's a little uh, more up in the air than the quarterback one, I would say. Uh, so let's get into it. Our quarter or head coach tiers uh, for this year in the NFL. Uh, before we dive into our head coaching tiers by division. They want to pass along some uh, breaking news that dropped today as well. Uh, legendary uh, Hall of Fame uh, offensive lineman Larry Allen from the yeah. Dallas Cowboys uh, suddenly passed away on vacation at 52 years old. And, you know, that's uh, obviously terribly sad and very young. I uh, don't know all of the details surrounding it, but uh, obviously that's terrible. And, you know, we were just talking about um, legendary offensive lineman earlier this year. Uh, and, and he was obviously on the short list of, of the greatest to ever do it. So yeah, he will be missed. And, uh, that's a brutal loss for the NFL for sure. A absolutely. Absolutely. Larry Allen, uh, truly like if he's on your starting offensive line, all team there, you're not getting much debate from most people. He yeah, is, he was exactly. that kind of special, special player. And it was a huge, huge component of a lot of those great Dallas Cowboys teams and offensive lines. And, He'll be missed, and it, again, we don't know all the details now, but 52 is so young. It's just uh, a real sad situation. Our hearts go out to his family and his friends and, uh, and the Cowboys organization for sure. So uh, we were talking about doing the head coaching tiers for this one, and, and yeah. we're going to start in the AFC and, and go through the, the different divisions in here. Any overall thoughts before we launch ourselves into the AFC North to start things off? What, what, what was going through your head when you were making these lists? Well, what was going through my head was it's like when we were doing this with the quarterbacks last week, there was those divisions that stood out. You're like, ooh, there's a lot of question marks at quarterback. And it feels like there's a lot of question marks in coaches in the same places. There's the question marks in quarterbacks. So like like the like the NFC South, the quarterbacks kind of like, uh, you know, who's uh, yeah. and it's like the coaches. Uh, a lot of I don't know. Same thing with like the AFC South. We talked about the young quarterbacks and how they could skyrocket. Well, you have a lot of young coaches. We just in and and, and uh, levels of coaching where it's like uh, you know Doug Peterson's the veteran with the Super Bowl ring, but then uh, Shane Steichen's the brilliant offensive mind, but his quarterbacks use question mark. Um, I also think there's one division that stands out to me that is a, a far and above the rest. Because the person I have at number four is someone who went to a Super Bowl and is someone who, what I saw them do last year especially, really impressed me. And it's like, well, I'm putting them four. I don't think that, like, what did we say with the quarterbacks last week where it's like, that's the best number four? I already know it's like, what division's my best number four by far? Like, 
that number four, I would take him as my head coach right now. Um, so it, certain divisions are blessed, and that's also what makes certain divisions really hard to predict. Uh, and so it, it's very funny how some of those overlap, where it's like the quarterback and the coaching controversies and questions seem to fall in a lot of the same spots. Yeah, yeah, no, that's very true. And, and we're going to you know give our, our thoughts at the end uh, of the show on those head coach quarterback combos. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, but we will begin be here with the AFC North looking at the tiers here. Uh, so I, I don't know if there's much debate. I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Um, Mike Tomlin for me is the the clear front runner in, in this division, but I, I know there's going to be a lot that uh, might disagree with that because of his lack of overall playoff success. But to me, he's still the best coach in this division. I have Harbaugh at one. And, and it's only right. be, if you would have told me this, if we would have done this three off seasons ago, I would have been with you 100% Tomlin. Two off seasons ago, I'd have been like, yeah, it's probably still Tomlin. Last off season, I've been like, oh man, uh, probably go with Tomlin. But I think there's been an erosion in the last couple of years that I just, I'm struggling to wrap my head around. Like Mike's value is obvious. Like it's obvious his value. And I think he's a really, really great head coach, but here's what I'll, so this, this is my I think Part of this was I have a case for Jim and I wanted to put him one. Cause I knew you'd put Tom on one. So here's my okay. case for Jim, right? What do we always say about the Steelers? How John, many head coaches? John. How many, how many, uh, John Harbaugh. Yeah. How many head coaches in the last 60 years? Uh, three. Yeah. Yeah. So how many head coaches for the Ravens over the last 60 years? Well, I mean, if we're, so we'll count the Browns before, cause they're technically the Browns, yeah. right? Um, yeah. But I mean, so when in the I, last my, 20, in the last 25, it's been, you know, Brian two. Billick and, uh, yeah. and John Harbaugh. So, but I, what I'll say is I think for Tomlin, he, would join an organization with incredible institutionalized success yes. and incredible institutionalized um, like leadership and stability. Harbaugh is to me now what really puts the Ravens on the map as like a, wow, look at this team that now has incredible institutionalized success and stability. Brian Bilk was there a long time and was very solid coach. I think Harbaugh's taken I mean, to the next level. They won a Super Bowl and had like did. legendary defenses. Yeah. Yes, no, no, I, I like yeah. I agree, and like, but I think now when you look at those two, it's like Harbaugh has helped carry the water in the way that Coward yeah. did for the Steelers, right? Like, and I don't know what's next after John, uh, after John Harbaugh, and how long he'll be there. But I also do think that John Harbaugh gets a lot of credit for the Lamar Jackson transition. You go from Joe Flacco and a very traditional style of offense, and you have now on multiple offensive coordinators for Lamar, but found a way for him to win two MVPs with different offensive coordinators and found success with this transition to the modern NFL game and the way that the Ravens have. I think it, it a lot of that falls on Harbaugh as far as creating a culture where that is successful. And I think his success recently gives me a little more of an edge for right now who's the best head coach in that division. I think I would lean towards Harbaugh, Harbaugh in the modern NFL right now feeling really comfortable. Um, I think this is yeah. the closest race, and I'm not going to fight you. I, I, again, I think it would be very 50-50 if we polled a lot of people, Harbaugh versus Tomlin right now, and I think both camps are very right. It's possible. I think it's more... To me, it's it's more clear uh, of a decision, but it's still one of the harder ones in this whole thing. Um, but I still think it's clear Tomlin because I just think that if you if we leveled playing fields, that Tomlin has the advantage. If if Tomlin had Lamar Jackson, like you, because you, you mentioned, like if I asked you about like three years ago, you would say Tomlin. Well, what's happened the past three years? Tomlin's had. Kenny Pickett and, you know, the very last vestiges of, of a aging Ben Roethlisberger and also Mason Rudolph and uh, Mitch Trubisky. Like, I don't know what John Harbaugh would have been able to do with that. I I'm skeptical as to whether he would have been able to go 500 the last couple of years. Yeah. With the teams that I the think had. my so, point in saying that was, though, was like. 
John Harbaugh like created Mike, the environment for Lamar. Mike's whereas only Tomlin success, Mike's only Canada. success has been with Big Ben, and when Big Ben right, was in right. his prime. No, that's and we true. would that's both true. argue. We would both argue Big Ben is better than Aaron Rodgers. Like we, you and I both agree that I think overall, when you maybe look at it in totality, Career, yeah. Big Ben and Aaron Rodgers should be one one eight. Like they should be right next to each other. So. And I, I agree with you. It's tough. His GM has put him in a tough spot. They have not been good at the quarterback position the last couple of years. Uh, and yeah. he has fought his ass off to stay above 500. He, but Tomlin's incredible. I love Tomlin. You know I love Tomlin. I hate arguing yeah, yeah. against him. No, and I, I love John Harbaugh, too. I mean, and he, I think, Har you know. Two of the best coaches in the league are in this division. I mean, that's. They they're are. They're both, in my view, top, you know, top eight in the Absolutely. league. Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I. I, I, I get where you're coming from. John Harbaugh's number two for me. I'm guessing Tomlin's number two for you then. I Tomlin's hope. two. Okay. Tomlin's two. And this is the this, division I said. This is the division I said is the hardest one. I think this is the best coach division in football. It it probably is. Uh, because, because if Tomlin four, I actually struggle if, with. Yeah, I have Stefanski three, and I go with I go with Zach Taylor at four. Stefanski, I give him the nod. Because I've seen what he's done now with multiple quarterbacks from Baker to Joe Flacco with Deshaun Watson. And he really is, a, I think, a very smart offensive coach. And I think he understands modern NFL football really well. But Zach Taylor, I, I, at this time last year, I would have had Zach Taylor probably still a clear four. But I think he gets more credit from me now after doing what he did with Jake Browning, like, cause a lot of it was just, Oh, well, he's got Joe Burrow. Well, look what he did with that offense of Jake Browning where they almost made the Cincinnati bagels almost made this, the playoffs without Joe Flacco. They did not fall apart. And there was one of the reasons why I think I'm so high on them to be a playoff team this upcoming year is that roster is very much, uh, I think got better. They added to it. If they could figure out the wide receivers to keep them happy and get them both to play, and Burrow's healthy. I think Zach Taylor's a very good coach. I would have Zach Taylor as my head coach over Matt Eberflus tomorrow if you told me I could. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm not me putting Zach Taylor here for Bengals fans. Don't jump down my throat. I like Zach Taylor a ton. Should he maybe get the nod over Stefanski because he's been to Super Bowl? Yeah, you can make that argument. I, there's something about Stefanski though that I just I think he's a better maybe overall leader of men and CEO. I've seen more of that from him in a really dysfunctional organization in Cleveland with a ton of dysfunction around him, he handled it well. He didn't ask for Deshaun Watson. Maybe he did, but he's inherited this mess, and he's done nothing but be successful with it overall. Um, and and I, I think he deserves a ton of credit for that. This, for me, was a 50-50 toss-up. I ended up giving a slight edge to Zach Taylor because of his success. I mean, yeah. I, I know that he's great. a lot of people would point to Joe Burrow, and I, that's, you know, you can't deny that but he still got to a super bowl uh you mentioned it like last year with jake browning like making sure the ship didn't completely sink and fall off uh there's something to be said for that for zach taylor and i think one of the biggest things is that kevin stefanski has at least had a top six or seven roster since he's yeah, been there it's true um and zach taylor outside of burrow and jamar chase and t higgins like he really hasn't. He's had a terrible defensive grouping of, uh, of personnel, uh, less than stellar offensive line. And so, yeah, I, I think Stefanski has had uh, a lot going for him in terms of what to work with. Now, the quarterback thing has been a disaster. And so, yeah, he gets credit for sure for helping install a offensive system that is conducive to running the football, uh, helping out that offensive line and uh, being able to make things work with Joe Flacco and getting them into the playoffs, things like that. I mean, that's uh, st stellar work. So I like yeah. them both a lot. They're both offensive-minded coaches. Yeah, Stefanski would probably work in more places. Oh, uh, yeah. But right now, Zach Taylor feels just like the perfect right fit for Cincinnati. They just need to get more. They, you know, they have the weakest GM. I was going to say, this is one of the strongest GM divisions as well. Uh, you know, Kevin Culver struggled for the Steelers towards the end of his career, but now that Omar Khan has come in, he's he's made some great deals for the Steelers. Eric DaCosta took over for Ozzie Newsome. Like, what a great yeah. track record there of GMs for the Ravens. And you got Andrew Barry uh, in Cleveland, uh, you know, who his story still to be written, uh, but 
they have a really good roster there. And so, yeah, I, I just think uh, that that's what gave the edge to Zach Taylor for me. But my I final think go either way. My final point of this, I'm, I'm, I misspoke earlier. It's my second best coach division in the NFL. Uh, and then I think my, my, what I'll say about Zach Taylor is I'm really excited to see what he does this year without Brian Callahan. So he's had Brian Callahan mm-hmm. with Burrow since they took yeah. the job. Callahan's now the head coach in, in Tennessee. We'll talk about that coming on up here in a second. And so now it's like, all right, is it more Zach Taylor, the offensive mind and Callahan was, it was working with what, what Taylor wanted to do, or was it, you know, Brian Callahan was the reason that Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase and all that worked. So we have a little bit of that. We'll, we'll learn a lot. And if Zach Taylor has a big year this year and a bounce back year with a new offensive coordinator and dealing with the drama of those wide receivers, uh, he could shoot up this list for sure. You're not getting to to two or one, but you could yeah. you could make you could make your solidify yourself as the third in this division. And uh, in in that saying some because again, I I think there's a lot of teams that would be happy with Zach Taylor as their head coach right now. Oh no doubt, no doubt, very talented division. All right, let's go to the South now, and uh, we've got obviously Jacksonville, yeah. Houston, Tennessee, Indianapolis. Uh, where do you stand on this one? This uh, the number one spot. I feel is kind of a toss up for me, but we'll, I, we'll see what you say. Well, I went with Dougie Doug because he does have the Super Bowl. He brought Philly as their first and only ever Super Bowl. And Doug, overall, again, when he did his first Call year me. in Jacksonville to again steady those waters after the disaster that was Urban Meyer with the with the fingering in the butt and the kicking of the kicker, <laughs> you got a lot. Like he had a lot to do there, and he did it. And so, yes, last year was a disappointment, but I don't know how much of that was on Doug. Uh, I, and I do, and I just think sometimes, you know, you just, you have a, an off year and things didn't go well. I, I'm excited for Jacksonville this year. I think they're, they're poised for bounce back year. I go D'Amico too. Um, so that's the way I have it. I think D'Amico yeah. has earned the right to be in that conversation because of that one incredible year, his first year. But I pump the brakes a little bit and just say, all right, let's see it again. Let's see what year two looks like. Because, you know, we talk about sophomore slumps with, like, a quarterback. What about sophomore slumps for a coach and a quarterback together? Had such a successful year one. What does year two look like? Are they yeah, reading the press clippings? Yeah, they set the bar pretty high. Yeah, they set their bar very high. I'm not saying he has to, he has to go back to the second round of the playoffs, but you know, like, is he going to have a, a a year like Doug had last year where there's some injuries or things don't go well, and all of a sudden you barely miss the playoffs. I don't want to trash him just because that happens either. So I have, I have Doug one D'Amico two. How's your one to go? That is, it's the exact same for me okay, too. Great. And yeah, I, for most of the reasons you said, I don't have much to add other than, you know, Doug did have to completely turn around an organization and had to weather some, you know, injuries, especially yeah. to Trevor, uh, you know, Trevor was less than 100% for the vast majority of yeah. last year, and that obviously hurt his performance. They also got wildly unlucky uh, several times last year, I felt, with just like a heel out of bounds in the end zone like six times. Yeah. Um, And just, you know, crazy calls and just different things like that. It's a frustrating um, so year. It was a frustrating year. I trust them. And yeah, you got to give D'Amico his flowers for the first year. But again, we have such a short, small sample size. It's hard to tell too much, and and that's why Shane Steichen comes at three for me because same, you know he and it's not you know super fair. It's just how we you have to rank when you have knowledge of the you know former two Shane. We have some knowledge, but he didn't have his quarterback for ninety uh, yeah. percent of the season, and they still did pretty well. He did well with almost made the playoffs. Like, like Shane could Shane could move into the number two spot next year. Like we'll oh. see what happens with Richardson, but. We at least know stuff of shame. We don't know anything about Brian Callahan, you know, yet. And so uh, that that's, you know, Shane get, deserves that three spot. I don't know if that sounds backhanded or not, but um, I, I think he's a pretty good head coach. Like, I think we'll find, yeah. you know, that if he gets the full year of compliment of, you know, his weapons and his team, he'll be able to put out a, a quality product. This is a, this is one of those divisions that's, is still very much on the rise as a whole. And so yeah. there's a lot to be gleaned still from these groups and these teams. And um, yeah. But yeah. I have Steichen, Steichen at three, Brian Callen at four. And for the same reasons you just said, Shane is Shane is the one 
three we've talked about so far that remember in the quarterbacks, we said, Hey, this, you know, like a Caleb Williams could go from three to one. Shane feels like if the the year That's they have true. this year, he could go yeah. three to one in this division. Like if they win the division, uh, this division is wide open as far as that goes. Like who's the coach in the division? Doug can only live off of the Philadelphia success for so long, um, and so I, I and so he needs they you know, and then for Brian Callahan, I'm beyond stoked to see what Tennessee looks like this year because you know Tennessee the last two years. Felt like they were holding on to their success of three and four years ago. And the success of three and four years ago was like run the football, Vrabel's intense defense, and then Tannehill made the throw when he needed to, right, to an A.J. Brown and just like made the play when they needed to. And then last year and then this past year, the last two years, it felt very much like the defense stinks, but we're still this defensive culture. The running game is dying, but we're still this running game culture. And now we just don't have a quarterback anymore. And so I'm excited for the Titans to lean into, no, no, we're an offensive culture now. <laughs> and like, we're just going to lean into offense. And we have a young quarterback with a big arm, and we're just going to lean into that. And so I'm really excited about watching Tennessee play football this year. And listen, if if, if Brian Callen can go to, go to Will Levis and say, hey, this is how Joe Burrow sees it and what he does. I think I think Will Levis could have himself a really fun and exciting year. I think it also could implode because that wide receiver core has got uh, age and uh, and they have a it's a young quarterback and a young offensive line, talent, uh, an improving offensive line, but young, so it could implode as well. Uh, but I'm excited for them. I'm, I'm for the Titans. I re, I, re, I truly am, and I'm I love that the Bears play the Titans Week One because I'll get like a full kind of taste of it Week One. I lost you. I can't hear you, Dan. Oh, there we go. I had yeah. muted myself briefly as I uh, tried to get my headphones. Okay, you're good. You're good. So we're we're all good. No, but I uh, I, I did hear what you said, and uh, yeah, no, I I agree. Um, I agree for a lot of those reasons that you outlined there. Uh, so let's move on to the AFC East now, and uh, we'll talk ourselves some this is uh, an interesting Cowboys, one. Commanders. Eagles and Giants, yeah. Wait, yeah, this AFC is a, East. an interesting AFC one. East. AFC. Or, uh, I'm sorry, AFC. Bills, East. Jets, why, Dolphins, yeah. New Orleans, uh, New England. Um, there you go. I I hate to do it, but I'm gonna. My number one is McDermott. Uh, Mike McDaniel. Sorry, uh, Mike McDaniel's, and um, I have McDermott too. I like McDermott a lot. I really do. But I think in an offensive league, and knowing the coaching tree he's come from. And also, he's now had two years. Like, because I remember with Mike McDaniel's, it was very much like, who is this kid? Like, are guys even going to listen to him? He, he's such a nerdy little pot smoking, like, weird guy. But now it's two years of like, oh, no, no, no. Th those dudes love him. And he's great at the microphone. And the players respect his knowledge in the same way that they respect Sean McVay's knowledge and LaFleur's knowledge. And, and and Shanahan's knowledge, they come from that tree. So I have no problem going Mike McDaniels, number one. And then I do have Sean McDermott, too. I think McDermott has earned the, a top one or two ranking in this division. He's won the division, what, how many times in the last four years? I think four or four. Um, he is a, he's a very, very good modern defensive coach. He doesn't feel old school defensive coach. He does feel like a modern defensive coach. My issue with him is nine the nine eleven quotes. Don't love that. <laughs> don't love. Don't love that. Not his finest and, hour. And and let's be honest, we haven't seen him in the biggest games. He, we haven't seen his team breakthrough. Whether that's his fault or not, it falls on him. So I have to put that on him. Yeah. No. I. It, I'm right there with you. I, Mike McDaniel takes that top spot for me. The ingenuity, the ability to, uh, you know make lemonade from some sour lemons at, at, at times. And it, he's just been a, a really solid head coach in terms of the leadership category. Cause that was the big question is like, okay, we know he's really smart. Uh, is he able to rally a group of men, especially with how young he is. Some players on the team were, were probably his age or a little bit older even. Um, but no, he's, he's proven uh, that he's a really solid head coach. Sean McDermott's just had some of those ups and downs throughout. Yeah. 
and he has the benefit of having a top three quarterback in the NFL. Yeah. And so you're going to be expected uh, to go on deep playoff runs consistently. And they just haven't done that to that consistent level. Uh, and the defense has really started to fall apart in recent years. And that's his bread and butter. That's like, you know, uh, it's like one thing you can't say about some of these, uh, you know, other coaches who that's their side of the ball. Like McVay has had turnover with his personnel and he's still had a, a phenomenal offense every year. Uh, Kyle Shanahan, the same thing. So, you know, Sean McDermott, you're expected to have like a top five to seven defense, whether that's fair or not, it, it's, it is what it is. And so, yeah, yeah. If they can, can get I that supporting cast really around it and have a full package, um, then, then yeah, then, then you should be good to go. But, um, for right now, he's number two because of those reasons. Now, it goes and win, wins a Super Bowl. Maybe. Oh, no, yeah. One. I mean, he needs, yeah. he's stuck. He's just, he's right now, he's the coach we say can, can't win the big get, can't win the big one. Like that's, he's the guy in the NFL right now. It's like, can't win the big one. I, my final point of McDermott will be this. Does it feel like when I was thinking about this, does it feel like McDermott, we just know who he is? Like, I don't think there's another level to McDermott as a coach. Like, even if he were to get a job somewhere else, like, I think if he got fired, he would earn a job somewhere else. Say he lands in, I, I don't know, Dallas or whatever in a year or two. It's like, I feel like, okay, well, just pencil them in for making the playoffs and then losing. It, he feels like a like a Kirk Cousins of a coach or a Dak of a coach where it's like, yeah, I know what I get. Like it's solid, but that's what I get. Like that's what I get. And then occasionally a really bad interception or a bad 9-11 quote. Like that's what you get. All right, I can't hear you again. You muted yourself again. Now I'm having to mute myself because I want to make sure there's no feedback coming through. So well, you sound good out. to me. All right, good, good. Um. So moving on to the three and four spot, then that is an interesting conversation yeah, well, because uh, Gerard Mayo could very well put himself in that three spot, but he's a rookie. We don't know. No, we do I do know he's Robert Sell has put out phenomenal defenses every year he's had to coach. So that's Sala, how that shakes out to, to me. me Sala is a, I think Sala, if he gets fired in at the Jets, he'll, I, he should have a job like quickly. I agree. I think he is a good head coach. I think he's a really good head coach. And I do think Sala has an it factor that Doug McDermott doesn't have. I just think that his problem is New York's organization is very flaky, very unsuccessful, very poorly run. And he has dealt with, he was handed Zach Wilson, and now he's been handed an injured, aging uh, communist in Aaron Rodgers. And so it's <laughs> a – he's got a lot to deal with. He's got a lot to deal with. I like Robert Sala a lot. Sala a lot. Yeah. I would – now, when I think about Sala versus, like, I put him in my situation, right? I think I'd stick with Ibraflus over Sala just in the sense that – I think they're both about the same, but I do like that Ibraflus is kind of like a – He's not a fancy guy. Like Sala does seem a little like New York, good looking, swagger, quotes. And maybe that's just because he's in New York. But I think that Sala's in that category of like, I, I think a lot of people would argue he's a better coach than Eberflus. And I think that's fine. Uh, but oh, yeah. I think he's somewhere in that like 12 to 15 range of a head coach. I think he's higher than you think when you actually start to look at these names. And, and yep. Dry Mayo, very excited for him. He's got the chance to do what D'Amico Ryans did last year where no one really believes in you, former player in your in your former place. Go go put up a hell of a season, and let's talk about you in a year from now. Yeah, and the problem is, I feel like if they have a lot of success, the New York Jets, it's going to all Aaron. be credited to Aaron Rodgers, especially because of the That's... disparity between the two, even if Robert Sella deserves well, his flowers all the same. Uh, unfortunately, but that's part of the being the head coach too, right? Like, it'll go. He's it'll not go, doing this for the recognition. It'll go. Aaron, ayahuasca, uh, <laughs> defensive line, yeah. Robert Sala. That's the yeah. that's the order in which the success. Somehow, ran. Alex Guerrero will will work yeah, himself. Yeah. Joe Rogan right after Sala. It'll go Joe Rogan then Sala, and then and then we'll then we'll come on back uh, to uh, to the rest of it. I, I think for me, that's the, the the key for Salah is, again, he deserves a lot of credit for keeping the ship together. Salah deserves a lot of credit for keeping the ship together through a lot of uh, adversity. 
You want to move on to the uh, AFC West, which I think we both would agree is the best coached football division in football. Yeah, it is. It it really is. That's especially the top is uh is very heavily weighted. Um, Antonio Pierce is really the wild card that that we're trying to figure out, right? But, uh, yeah, no. Right now, it's Andy Reid number one, and there's not really a close second. So that's. I feel like we can kind of probably quickly breeze through yeah. that, unless you have any thoughts. No, Andy's one. That one spot. Andy's one. I want. I'm interested who you put two. Yeah, number two, I put Jim Harbaugh. And, ah, uh, me too, baby. Yeah, yeah. let's go, Jim. I put Jim too. I love, yeah. I love Harbaugh. He just came off a national Great. title and he's proven in the NFL already. Now, again, that was a decade ago, but I don't think Jim Harbaugh, because of what he's done at Michigan and being near the game, it's not like it was not like John Gruden where he was successful 10 years ago and then was an analyst. Like he's been in the grind for 10 years. So I don't think the game has passed Jim Harbaugh by. And I think that Jim Harbaugh in a five year window will be amazing. And then what does right. year six, seven, eight look like when he wears you down and you're sick of his getting rid of the music already? He's gotten rid of the music at Chargers camp, I've heard, and things like that. Yeah. We'll I see. That. We'll see. So yeah. uh I, I have I have Harbaugh two as well. Uh, who do you go three? He, he's just super consistent. That's yeah. what like like Jim Harbaugh is going to produce results all the time. Whether or not he's gonna win the Super Bowl every year or get to the championship game, th that's a toss-up for really anybody yeah. other than like Andy Reid and Bill Belichick and stuff. Um, but his consistency and, and we, and we know like we're going to get a good product out there is why he's number two. And it's why Sean Payton's number three. I personally think Sean Payton is one of the most overrated coaches of all time while still saying he's a really good head coach. I do yeah. think he's a really good head coach. I agree. I still I agree. think people lift him up to be this hall of fame caliber head coach. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not seeing it. He had a lot of seven to nine years with new Orleans. He had good pockets of like three seasons where they were really, really strong, but then they fell off. And then it's three more seasons, really, really strong. And then, you know, just inconsistency at times. And I mean, the guys had Drew Brees, you know, for the majority of his career. He goes nine and eight his final season with New Orleans. Then he comes back last year and, and, and signs on to a job with Russell Wilson. Like he knew what he was getting. And I think they should have gone better than eight and nine, uh, all things said and done. I don't think Sean was willing to adjust his coaching style at all to fit the personnel that he inherited, which included yeah. Russell Wilson, of course. Um, so, yeah, I, right now, Sean Payne's got to be number three for me. He can obviously yeah. change this if he puts together some – if he rebuilds the Broncos and uh, and puts them on a trajectory for like five straight years of winning seasons and does really good, okay, but, you know – Jim Harbaugh's won everywhere he's gone at all times. Uh, I'm not seeing that from Sean Payton just yet. No, so. and, and Sean Payton's been around a long time. He's got he's the 20th yeah. all time leader in coaching wins in the regular season, but that's still behind, tied with John Harbaugh. Uh, but John Harbaugh has been coaching less time. He's a head coach for less seasons. And I mean, is Sean Payton a Hall of Famer in your mind if he were to retire today? I think Sean Payton's close. I think he's close. He's probably close. He's probably close. But I think he need like the pressure is on. Like the pressure is on because I'd argue similarly to Tomlin, where the little bit of the pressure is on, like your career and success right now is all tied to one guy who we argue is a top 10 quarterback of all time. He is in Drew Brees. And it's like, so where do we go from there? I, I agree with you. I think he's a good head coach, but I think he and the media sometimes think of him as this like this prodigy guru yeah. absolute elitist right now i think he's the third best head coach in that division i think he's a top 10 head coach in the nfl right now though i do think if you had to, if you had to go that way and he is to put a huge target on his back he took the sixth quarterback off the board that pick number 12 and it's his guy and it's the guy he says is like drew Brees. so go go make him drew Brees, and then i'll and then i'll bump you up to number two on this list next year yeah, and no excuses with this one either because you can't come no. back to us in two years and say, well, he was the sixth quarterback. No, like you could have you chose went all in. to build they, up your roster and go absolutely. take a quarterback next year or figure it out. So No they, one would have blamed them. No yeah. one would have blamed them. Yeah, no, they're tied to this. They are tied to this for sure, and Sean Payton is, is equally tied. Uh, Antonio Pierce could be a really good head coach as well. Yeah. We just don't know enough yet. Um, but this, yeah, this could – this He's in a tough be, division. Strengthen its position as the best uh, division of head coaches. Yeah. If uh, Antonio P Pierce has a nine and eight season this year.
No, I, I love Antonio Pierce. I'm pumped for him to get this job. I'm, I, I'm pumped that the Raiders didn't force the quarterback either. I think that it's really yeah. smart for them to say, hey, we improved our roster in this offseason. We're going to be competitive as heck, but we hope to be competitive as heck while also ending up with a top five pick. And then we can get the guy for us to go in there and compete at a high level um, with two of the best quarterbacks in the NFL that are in our division. So uh, yeah, I'm 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 all I'm all about the Raiders and Antonio Pierce being four, and it's not a negative on that. I I think that I think that depending on how the years goes, like I said, I predict the Raiders could have more success than the Broncos this year. I really think that's a possibility, and if it is, I will credit a ton of that to Antonio Pierce. Yeah, because they don't have. Um, a rookie quarterback with a, a high ceiling. They have Garner Minshew. Yeah, they have a, sure. they have the definition of the spot starter. So we'll see what happens. All right, let's go to your division, the NFC North. This was a fun one to to I, work through as well. Can yeah. I make the argument? And I think maybe at the end we can kind of debate this really quickly. I think the NFC North is in the debate for the yeah. third best head coached. Division in football. It's in the debate. I, I, yeah, so I think AFC there's AFC West, then AFC North, and then yes, I think, NFC North. Is and then, and I do think the NFC West has something to say about that. Yeah. yeah but I think that's sure. like, that's, that's where like today, right now, that's the toss up. Like you could, it's a toss up for that third spot between no, the NFC really good division, really good North division. and the West. Okay. I have Dan Campbell one. I have Matt LaFleur two, Kevin O'Connell three, Matt Ibraflus four. I'm not a homer. My guy, my guy has a lot to prove. This is a big year for Matt Eberflus. Um, Kevin O'Connell, I think, is a very good head coach, but Matt LaFleur to me deserves to be at the two because even though their careers are very similar right now, they both have had some success. The fact that Matt LaFleur, the way he called out his quarterback early last year in those press conferences, remember, we said it. Matt LaFleur was saying, well, my quarterback's making some really shitty reads, and even though we're trying to coach him out of it, he was very honest mm -hmm. at the microphone with that they were losing because of their quarterback. And the way he then rallied that team to be a throw away from beating San Francisco in San Francisco for a trip to the NFC title game, I, Matt LaFleur deserves a ton of credit for that. I hate to say it because I, I despise his organization, but I think he's a very good head coach. I only put him at two because I think there is something uniquely special about Dan Campbell in the same way that I think there was something uniquely special about John Madden. I'm not saying that Dan Campbell's as good of a head coach as John Madden. I get Madden. it. The energy, though. But there is something. Madden was a great X's and O's guy. But there was also a, 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 a gravitas and a personality to him that you could not deny. You just could not deny. There is no one in the NFL right now maybe more likable for their players besides Andy Reid. I'd go Andy Reid one, Dan Campbell two. There is nothing but bleed for this guy. He represents his city perfectly. And 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 by getting his team within a, a play or two away from, an, uh, from a Super Bowl, what he's done for the Detroit Lions, the Detroit Lions, Dan Campbell can be my head coach any day. I think Dan Campbell, if we were just going one through – 10, where is he in the top 10? It's hard for me to put him in the top five, but he is sniffing that. He is in that, he is the leader of the clubhouse in that six through 10 group for uh, the next guy to break into the top five head coach in the NFL. I love Dan Campbell, love what he's done, and I think he deserves to be number one here. I love Dan Campbell as well. And I, I, I if I was just like a personal choice of who I would want to, like, to be the head coach of my team, if, you know, we're, we were just like starting from scratch and we didn't have, you know, the the choice of Mike Tomlin, of course, I would say, oh, Dan Campbell, like that'd be awesome. But for number one here, I did. I put Matt LaFleur because of That's, the production. Um, yeah, he's been very you know, productive. Multiple Dan NFC Campbell title games around an organization. So that's that to me is like the biggest plus in his, you know, pros column is that he took a, a perennial loser and made them winners. And to your point, all of the players absolutely love playing for him. Uh, he's a leader of men, clearly. But Matt LaFleur went to four straight NFC Championship games. I, I know he did that with uh, Aaron Rodgers. But then to have the season he had last year with a Jordan Love, who many had written off as a complete you know, bust, at, Midway through the year, pick. it was it was the Packers might be drafting a quarterback. Yeah, people like, forget how that year ended. It's impressive. Yeah, no, I and and his um, 
you know, now that the years have gone by and we've gotten used to it, he's probably fallen off the list of what everyone talks about the, uh, you know, super smart, uh, dial it up, uh, analytics and X's and O's guy. Cause the Mike McDaniels, the Sean McVay's have more, maybe like name recognition and, and staying power, but man, the floor's pretty close in that conversation with those guys. And I, he's, yeah. he's super talented and that stuff that will, that, that can and will last, uh, for a long, long time. So he's number one, Dan he's Campbell, too good looking. very close. He's too to good looking. Me. That is a problem. <laughs> That's he's a good looking guy. Good looking guy. He's too good sure. looking. Yeah, the basketball the, coach, it works. I don't think it works in the NFL. Dan Campbell could curl about three Matt LaFleurs, though. So there is that as <laughs> I well. I love Dan Campbell. Um, yeah, Kevin O'Connell, three for me, too. Um, He's a great three. When you start to look yeah, around the threes in the NFL, he you could argue he's like, I'd take him over Shane Steichen. I would take him over Robert Sala. My other threes we talked about, I'd take him over Kevin Stefanski. I'd take him. I might probably, take him over Zach Taylor. Uh, I'd take him over Sean Payton and Zach Taylor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, he's he is a very good three. I think I'd take him over the three in the NFC West, which we're going to talk about here shortly. So I think he is one of the reasons why I think this is the third best coach coach division in football because of of his uh, approach to the game. Former quarterback, again, and I think also one of the things that gets forgotten about him because he's kind of nerdy looking. He's like every bit of six six. Like he is a yeah, no, large yeah. man. And I do think there was a time we net, you know, like during that uh quarterback series on Netflix where he was screaming at Kirk and Kirk had to be like, all right, I'm sorry. Sorry. Like he's a like I I think there was a he's level of like you don't figure. you don't fuck with with Kevin O'Connell. Like he's yeah. kind of like he's got a little bit of that to him. And, he's a and dude. so I yeah, I love Kevin O'Connell. I hate, I hate that my my division is just loaded with like likable awesome coaches and then it's like and young and then They're it's like young. we got the guy who he got a haircut this off season you see that <laughs> yeah. Matt Eberflus yeah. got a haircut working with the beard sometimes, you got a beard. sometimes not you know He's got hey. a beard and a haircut look out but you know what Matt Eberflus has that all of these guys don't Caleb, Caleb Williams Caleb and the Bears Williams. Let's so go. I will say <laughs> this Matt Eberflus has a chance depending on how this year goes, to move up a spot on this. I mm -hmm. think if Matt, I will say in Matt Eberflus's credit, once he got Montez Sweat, a yeah, difference-making defense. defensive player, for the yeah. first time in his two years as a coach, a year and a half in, his defense went from a bottom 20 defense to a top 10 defense. And that is, that is it goes to show you the scheme is there. The fit is there. The understanding is there. The players are needed to be there and you add in that one giant piece and all of a sudden Jalen Johnson is making is balling out and the back end of that defense looks really good so I think this Bears defense is improved a full year in this system for guys like Edmonds Edwards Sweat Jalen Johnson got his money I think it, Matty Eberflus has a has a chance to move up in this ranking it, it, it because it can't get any worse it was a very very bad first year an awful first year and a Second year that was defined by a lackluster effort down the stretch in some crucial games, even though his defense did play better. All right, let's go to the poopy bowl of the <laughs> NFC South. And coaches, no offense. To I wasn't them. ready for that at all, but it's so true. <laughs> the poopy bowl. This, uh, this is a rough one. Um, and well, look, two of these guys, we don't even know what we're getting. If they're amazing <laughs> head coaches... They could they could help resurrect is, the it, NFC South. It is funny because a year ago at this time, I was calling for the job of the guy I have number one, Todd Bowles. Todd Bowles is my number yeah, I one. I know, I know. And a year ago, I was saying that Tampa Bay should tank and they can yeah. fire Bowles yeah. mid season. And now it's like, dude, sign this guy to a five hundred million dollar contract. And <laughs> now it feels like, hey, you got some culture there and you got mm -hmm. some stability. Yeah, they. They look Tampa, good. They got a quarterback. Um, I think he deserves to be number one because yeah. he's he in this division because of the people who have you have two new coaches and the guy who else was there is maybe one of the worst coaches in NFL history. I just can't stand him. And I might change yeah. my rankings on the fly here now just because no, I may leave it. Because I mean, I, I put Dennis Allen too, and that was only because so I, I have put, no idea. 
So I put Raheem Morris too because he's been a coach before, right? All right. He did he did a lot for that defense in in Los Angeles the last two years. Yes. And I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt of when he was a head coach for it, he was very, very young. He's still extremely young. But like, all right, what can you learn from this? How do you grow? And so I give him I, – he can't be worse than Allen. He's better than Allen. And so I, I put – Maybe, though. I put Allen three. I put Allen three. And then at four, Dave Canales, who – you know the story with Dave Canales and the whole, like, sex uh, addiction? No. Okay. Wait, maybe I did hear this. Um, But I, I don't know the specifics of it. I mean, that sounds familiar, but that I don't know anything about All it. Right. Talk for a second, and let me uh, let me okay. find this here. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, w- we were going, you know, through this list, and, and the reasons I have Dennis Allen at number two over Raheem Morris, I've, I've listed is like I just don't know what I'm getting. I also think Dennis Allen for as ba- it's been bad. It, it, I'm not trying to sugarcoat it, but um, at the same time, like I, I oh, do think I that he's gotten there. There's been a a floor that won't be dropped out in new Orleans. Like if he was the worst, uh, I, I feel like new Orleans would have won three games or two games. True. You know, okay. That's fair. Like he's done, he's done enough with the defensive line. He's done enough with like, okay, we'll work with Derek Carr and have a respectable offense that can at least, you know, do stuff. Um, so that's, I mean, it's a low bar, it's a low bar, but that's what yeah. put me there for, for Dennis Allen, Raheem Morris could, I mean, the, if there's one division with his, the most variants, it's this one. I mean, Raheem Morris could be number one next year. Dave Canals yeah. could be number two. Uh, who knows? Uh, we can go up and down the so board. But D- I'm curious what 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 this. So Canales Dave Canals now now this shout out to pardon my take. I they were the first ones who brought this to my attention when he got hired. Someone okay. on part of my take brought brought this up to them. So Dave Canals has a book that he's written, and if you know Dave Canals looks like he is an extremely good looking man. He's like. He is like like the cr- coach in the NFL by far. He might be, and he's very ripped, and he's a young guy. He's 42. Well, apparent he wrote a book. He's extremely, extremely religious. So, like, he doesn't, like, do a ah. press conference where he doesn't talk about religion. And it's all because, <laughs> well, it's not all, be- well, he's leaned hard into his faith because he was basically caught cheating on his wife. His wife was going to leave him. And then he, 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 in order to save his marriage, he went to an extreme faith-based couples counseling. Gotcha. And his, his wife and him co-wrote a book about the dangers of pornography. Oh, they co-wrote it? Well, yeah. So uh-huh. the, the dude Lord. is basically like, at that point, listen, if you cheat on your wife and you're cheating on your wife and she catches you like you're like addicted to porn, you have two options. You have the embarrassment of I got to save this marriage. And so I'm going to make my wife's going to make me write a book where I admit I'm addicted to porn. And I go to faith-based couples counseling for years, or you just say, listen, let's just call it what it is. Let's get divorced. And I'm going to keep being a football coach and live my life. He chose the latter where his wife basically says like, I own your balls. Now you're, you, you're dead. You're, you're mine now. Can you imagine being in the position? <laughs> you write a book. You say, I was, I cheated on my wife because I was addicted to porn. Listen, that you're that, that yeah. type of man, but also, that's a tough he spot. Be, he could be very genuine, which is almost scarier. And so, also regards. scary, it's, too. I, like, I mean, I, I was I so addicted like to porn, have, you know, complete and total. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so Dave Canales, I just got to say this. If he loses and he doesn't win a lot, it could be a bit. There's a lot of internet. There's a lot of great quotes from the book that could go viral. I'm just saying. (laughs) Yeah. There's a lot of great quotes from the book. Oh, my gosh. People, like, honestly, some of the players should just take a line from the book and have it written on the the whiteboard every Monday. The book, uh, how can you be a leader of men as a former porn addict who's what you basically said? I don't want to lose my wife, so she's making me write a book about how I was a porn addict, and now I go to extreme religious couples counseling. Yeah, like they'll, he'll come in for the the morning meetings after a really brutal <laughs> loss, and there's just the quote on the board: "Sometimes it can be too hard." Yeah, <laughs> it's written on quotes, and and the guys are like, 
yeah, coach, you know, that was a tough, hard loss, hard loss. Yeah. I feel like maybe like, I feel like maybe he was in the Ashley Madison dump or something. I don't know. Maybe, oh God. Maybe. <laughs> but wow. yeah, look it wow. up. Dave well, Canales, look. porn addiction, alcohol, porn addiction, infidelity, his marriage to Lizzie, Lizzie Canales. And, um, you know, that's, that's got a, a, uh, that's got a hints of like a Philip rivers being on that local access TV show. Yeah. Um, he has ceased so. alcohol and resisted the lure of pornography, embodying a renewed dedication to both his marriage and his coaching career. Listen, if your coach Absolutely. can't have a drink after a tough game because he's worried, then he'll end up, you know, 30 pages deep on Pornhub in the comments. I don't know. There, there if are I some want, deeper, deeper issues to work. I don't know through. if I need yeah. him to be I, the leader of men when he's in those yeah, yeah. intense conversations with David Tepper. David Tepper might have the book out. And I'm not just saying like, he might have to bring the book out. Oh man, that's good stuff. Good stuff. Well, the NFC South certainly has a colorful group. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, bookended by one Dave Canales. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's take our ourselves to the NFC East now. Now we'll get to the NFC East, as I alluded to earlier, uh, with the command. This is a tough one. Eagles, Cowboys, command. Very yeah, tough. Yeah. It it is uh Giants um as well. I think I said commanders twice, whatever. Um this hate- this was a tough one. I think I'm gonna surprise you with my number one. You pick. go first because I hate my ranking. I really Dan do. Quinn Maybe- is number one for me. I well, I hate I, that. <laughs> I truly I truly think Dan Quinn's a phenomenal coach. I think he got kind of um was scapegoated in some ways. Uh, in Atlanta? And, and and rebuilt an entire Cowboys defense. I like him a lot. I just don't trust any of these other guys, to be honest. I I guarantee we're not going to have any of the same rankings for any of All right, what do you go uh, choose then? Four. This is going to be the one where I'm completely like... Um, just let me hear yours then. Let's just go then. Yeah, number two is Nick Sirianni for me. Mm. Number mm-hmm. three is Mike McCarthy and four is Brian Dable. <laughs> I have Dable four. You probably have Dable one, I'm guessing. I have Brian Dable one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brian. Dude, I, I just, have... What has he done? I, I have Mike I, McCarthy two. I have Sirianni three and Dan Quinn yeah. four. So... We, yeah. so yeah, I, we're completely out, my out. so I hate this. Listen, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stand here and die in the hill for any of this because no, I I'm tough. with you. Like I, it's, I hate uh, this grouping. <laughs> it's tough. I if you told I think what I I go off of is I just say to myself, okay, tomorrow the Bears have a head coach opening, and you say you you get to choose your head coach, but it comes from the NFC the NFC East. I think in my panic mode, I would go. I need offense, and I love Brian Dable's offensive mind. Like, he is the reason Josh Allen, since Josh he left Josh Allen, it, it has not been the same 100% for Josh Allen. And what he did with Daniel Jones in year one was extremely impressive. Year two was a disaster. It was. But there were moments still with that offense, you're like, okay, it's not, it's not the scheming. It's a lack of talent. It's a lack of institutional success. A lack of uh, 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 and and you know the head coach is to blame for some of that. You got to coach guys up, right? But I I just saw so I went with that. Mike McCarthy, I have over Sirianni because while I think that Nick Sirianni has a slightly higher ceiling than Mike McCarthy, Mike McCarthy does have a Super Bowl ring. He's been doing it a long time, and I do know what I get from Mike McCarthy. He is the offensive Sean McDermott, where you're like, okay, that's good. You did good. You got me to 10 wins, and then, yeah, it flames out. Sirianni, I think the, the, the floor is very low. I think Sirianni's hanging on by a thread. And I think part of it is he was young, energetic. He was propped up by Shane Steichen and, and, and Gannon, who are now head coaches in their own right. They went to a Super Bowl on the back of a really talented quarterback and two really good coordinators and really star players. And then last year when it was like, hey, this is your team now, all we got was infighting, ugliness, and a team that fell apart late. Uh, Absolutely fell apart. So Sirianni, to me, he can go right back up. If he has a great year and he gets control of the reins, he he can go like basement, basement, Probably doesn't have a job in the NFL next year if he gets fired from the Eagles. And with Dan Quinn, I 
I worry Dan Quinn is old school defensive head coach in modern NFL. That's my only concern. When we last saw Dan Quinn, these those last couple years in Atlanta were not great. They weren't disasters. They weren't three and thirteen, right? They weren't. They right, just weren't. Right. They had expectations of Super Bowl, and they were seven and nine, seven and nine, nine and seven, and it just wasn't right anymore. I love that he waited and waited and stayed in Dallas. I think that was smart of him not to jump right back into it. I do think, though, there's a reason why Seattle would have been the right spot for him to go back to Seattle, yet they chose a young, unproven offense, a defensive coordinator over him. And then it just kind of was like, oh, well, the Washington job. And I do think he'll be successful in year one and year two with Washington because he knows this division extremely well. But what will it look like in years three, four, five? Can he help develop a young quarterback? I'm unsure of all of that. So I just, I, 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 it's tough. It's it's tough. All four of these are like C's. I don't, I don't want to do anything with them, but I have to rank them one through four. So, I I, on potential alone, I think Brian Dable has the highest ceiling still, and I know that's different than the way I ranked them before, but. I hate them all. Like, I don't want, like, (laughs) now, would I I take Brian Dable as my head coach right now in Chicago over Matt Eberflus? Yes. I think I would stick with Eberflus over the others, honestly. If you told me today, you can swap. Because I at least think that Eberflus has the the culture going in Chicago, and then you got to rebuild it if you're Dan Quinn. Sirianni, I don't trust right now. And Mike McCarthy, I just don't think the ceiling is high with Mike McCarthy. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's um, that's pretty much spot on to what I'm. Are any of like, them top ten coaches for C's. you? No, 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 no. Um, yeah, no, they're they're all C's. I don't think so I agree either. With that. Um, I don't think so either. Yeah, is in my head. I'm like Harbaugh, Tomlin, Harbaugh, McDaniel, Reed. Reed. Um, you'd put Peyton in the top ten, I'm sure. Um. Yeah, McVay, Shanahan, Floor Campbell, Lafleur I mean, Campbell. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, like yeah, they're they're the these highest. Guys are one. all bottom fifteen. Like they're all in that like yeah, twelve to twenty. Yeah, it's tough. And it's tough. Like, my my reasonings are real quick to go through them are that uh, Dan Quinn, you know, and maybe if I thought about it a little bit more, and and after hearing you talk, like maybe I would switch this up slightly, but. Um, Dan Quinn, I just like I feel I feel comfortable, I guess would be the word. Okay. Um Sirianni, I do the, think the floor I mean, is high with Dan Quinn, right? I right, agree. I think right. we agree. It's yeah. like a seven and nine. Like you're a seven and nine with Dan Quinn. Yes. Yeah. And and so there, there's a comfort level there. Sirianni, I, I think because of what he's he's done with a very young roster overall, does need to be warranted. And I know there's a lot of things we don't like and Sometimes he acts like a player too much, and yeah. uh, sometimes he doesn't see. But like overall, he's gone to the Super Bowl, and despite a a, a bad meltdown last year, no doubt, um, they still made the playoffs. They still made the playoffs. Mike McCarthy, it's just uh, we've seen it a million times, and I just don't think there's any movement there. And then Brian Dable, I still like. I just I'm waiting to see it. Like, is Fair. he another one of those great coordinators who's just not that great as a head coach? I don't know. I mean, we've. We've had plenty of examples of that in the Mike Martzes and Fair. the Adam Gases and Wade Fair. Phillips, Vic Fangio. Like, there's a lot of these guys who are phenomenal coordinators that just don't make it out as head coach. And I, I will. S- I'm not saying he's that yet, but I'm saying I don't think he's graduated to the point where I'm like, oh yeah, he's he's a good head coach. He's got. So it down can I past. can I ask you this? My final point of this will be, if at the end of the season all four of those guys were fired. Which is the one that's most likely to get a head coaching job before the next season? It's uh, it's probably Dable. Yeah, it it's is probably Dable. But because I think of the that's potential, of him being it's, offense and him being young. Yeah, and he's got and, an attitude like he's a short, stocky. Like there's an attitude there that I think. Football dude, he's a football guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I all I right. Agree. Let's wrap it up. NFC West time. All right, let's do it. We got the 49ers, the Rams, the Arizona Cardinals, and the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, I guess the big question is going to be who's one, who's two, really, right? Because, I mean, 
that's the biggest toss up I think it uh, is. between uh, uh, you know, I give the advantage to the person who if it ain't got that ring I don't want to hear a thing I, I I go Sean McVay yeah I'm there Kyle you. Shanahan can't right now the narrative is he can't win the big one he's an incredible coach an incredible coach can't win the big one so I go McVay Shanahan and then I give Gannon over Mike McDonald I have to read his Dang. name because I still can never remember it all season long Seattle God bless you knowing that your court coach is named Mike McDonald. Um, <laughs> yeah. He, and so Gannon, I don't like, but I, I'll give him the advantage. I at least know that he was better than the pew, pew, pew. Like I thought it was going to be a total disaster. Yeah, he's better he was than better, expected. Better Definitely. than expected. Definitely. But um, McVay and Shanahan are two of the top five, in my opinion, coaches in the NFL. They're, they are two top five guys, and they're both going to be head coaches for many, many years to come as long as they want to. And it sucks they're in the same division, similar to the Harbaugh Reed thing, because one of them is going to always have to play in the wild card. One of them is going to win that division. Um, and uh, if Kyle Shannon can eventually prove in a big game that he can manage it and get his team to a victory, then he will instantly become maybe in that top two or three coach of all th uh, in the NFL right now. But right now, sure. I have yeah. Sean McVay over. Got to get over the hump, no question. Yeah, Jonathan Gannon definitely... I, I wouldn't say impressed, but he exceeded expectations. Yes, expectations great way to so say low. It. They were um, very low. Pew, they were very pew, low. Shots. Uh, explosives. <laughs> That's the. It truly is. And that was put out by the Cardinals. Like it they, was so they, bad. They <laughs> showed the video. They weren't like, hey, can we do another take? Can we do a take of that? And just, can you stop being a psycho in front of the, your players? Just don't do that. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, he had uh, the sample size with Kyler. Wasn't that bad? And now he'll have the full season. We can fully judge it, I think, after this year yeah. as to what we're working with. Mike McDonald, too, I think we're going to have to extend a little bit of grace to this guy because I think even after this year, there's a lot There's a lot of they need to not reset. great roster. There's not much depth in Seattle. Their defense is kind of in shambles. They need to the reset. quarterback situation's up in the air. Who knows what's going to happen with DK Metcalf? There had been you know trade rumors in the air yeah. and aging Tyler Lockett. So they've got Jackson Smith and Jigba and a good young running back core of Kenneth Walker and Zach Charbonnet. But outside of that, like, so they've got some weapons, but there, yeah. there's a lot of question marks in Seattle. I so expect I think, Seattle to be competitive, though. I think he'll come in. He'll give a new yeah. energy. I think they'll be competitive, but it's a tough division. And uh, and uh, I you just, Gino, it's like, Gino now has a chance to, like, show it wasn't a total fluke. Right. Two years yeah. ago, great. Last year, okay. If he can have a great year again, then it's like, all right, well, then, you know, it wasn't a fluke. They haven't ripped it down to the studs. Like they they no. have things to work with. And so they can be competitive for that reason. You're right. Yeah. Um, but I would say if they win five games next year, I depending on how that happens, um, I think that Mike McDonald might, you know, should get a year two because yeah, agreed. Can they get a quarterback in there? Can they figure those, you know, where the direction of this franchise is going? Totally. Um, there's more pressure on the Cardinals to perform because they have the quarterback and they've just got the you know, he deserves, two, if he's solid, he'll pick. deserve a chance to be like, all right, let me get my quarterback now. Right. Yes. yes. If it's not, if, if they, if they're ugly and they lose and they lose a lot of games, this team shouldn't lose a lot of games. It should be a seven, maybe eight win team. Yeah. Like if they, if they lose, if they only win three or four games, then it's like, is he the right guy? Right. Right. Yep. Very true. So, all right. Well, that's a look at the list. That, that was, that was a fun one. Um, Really look forward to seeing how this one uh, ages and pans out come the end of the season. But yeah, right. I, I, I think we feel pretty confident, at least with a few of those, for sure. Yeah. So, um, cool breakdown on the divisions. Um, excited. We've got um, some some more guests coming up this month uh, that I'm excited to talk shop with here on the show. Uh, and then before we know it, training camp will be off and running in just a few weeks. So it uh, should be very exciting. Uh, to to see those things develop the June first um, uh, deadline for a lot of roster um, or, or I should say uh, payroll decisions has just passed, which means there might be some trade talks starting to heat up in the next couple of weeks because once um, June first hits, teams have more flexibility with how they yep. work their contracts. So some players couldn't be traded until after June first because they were owed certain amount of money ahead of time. Um, I don't even know all of the full detailed specifics on that, but just know 
now that it's after June 1st, there might be some more movement in the NFL. Especially with guys holding out as camps begin and you just want to move on from a headache. Like there's going to be some stories for sure. Yes, absolutely. So uh, that does it for us here on the Football Lounge with Mark and Dan at FB Lounge Pod on any social media uh, that you might be on. Also check us out at 4 com for all of the other shows along with all of our content um, over this past year. And, uh, and yeah, we got some great stuff there at the four frequency sake podcast network. Please check us out and everybody else out. It really helps us, uh, help grow the show, grow the following and, uh, and, and bring more shows like this to you. Uh, but that'll do it for us today. We'll see you back here next time.